Hey everybody, this is the debrief presented by Bright Hire. The series that you're turned into is Masters of Sales Hiring, featuring top sales leaders sharing lessons learned from building world-class sales teams. I'm your host, Teddy Chestnut, co-founder of Bright Hire, and I am joined today, I'm so thrilled to be joined today, by Dini Mehta, who was most recently the CRO of Lattice, so yeah, Drawbridge and Quantcast, just an incredibly well-respected leader in the HR tech space, which I feel very close to, obviously. I have learned a ton from even a few conversations. Dini, I'm so glad to have you on the series today. Thank you, Teddy. Super excited to be here. Love talking about all things hiring and HR tech, so very excited to be here. Awesome. Uh, well, we are going to jump right in and talk about your time at Lattice. You joined as employee number what? Like at 38. Lattice. Late 30s. Yeah. Late 30s. And and when you uh when you swan sawned out of there, what the uh, the team had grown uh, the revenue grew like 33x, the team had grown 20x. What a crazy ride to be on. Uh, uh before we get into hiring and building teams, I'm just curious on your reflections on that ride. What went well? What were you most like what were you most proud of? As you, as you grew with the team from such an early stage to, to such scale? Gosh, it's, it, was, it was such a fun ride. Um, it was hard and some really tough days and quarters and months. But overall, when I reflect back, I'm just filled with gratitude. Um, and it was so fun building a different type of sales org. I went to Lattice to see if you could build a different type of sales org. And I got the opportunity to do that and do it with a bunch of amazing people that were so mission aligned. So yeah, I feel very lucky to have to have been part of that journey with some amazing people. When you say a different kind of sales org, tell, tell me about that. What do you mean? I mean, I was, you know, I, I like fell into sales. I grew up in India, moved to Kansas for college. So I came here on a student visa. The plan was to become a doctor and engineer, uh, or that, that's what my parents' plan was. And uh, I fell into tech and definitely tried to fight sales for the first few years because I had this negative impression of what it meant to be in sales. And so when I got in it, I, I didn't see a lot of people that looked like me. I didn't feel like I belonged in the first few years when I was in sales. Mm -hmm. And over time, that became my why was to help change the perception because sales is amazing. There is, I, I love it. It's objective. It's data driven. Um, and so I wanted to build an org where a younger me would have felt more comfortable and mm -hmm. it would attract tons of different types of people. So change that sort of impression that still exists in the world, that it's about lying, it's about pressure tactics, uh, when in reality, that's not the truth. Uh, sales can be an amazing opportunity to leapfrog in your career and really accelerate it um, if you do it right. So that was my, my dream was to help rewrite some of the rules where you know, traditional sales orgs are built on scarcity and fear. You're pitted against your teammates and other teams and how do you create an org where you win together, where, mm. where, where you're all in it together? Yes, it's a competitive sport, but it's also a team sport. And so that was my hope when I joined Lattice. And I feel very lucky to, to have had the chance to build something with great people. I love that. How did that orientation, as you got the opportunity to build the team, influence how you approached hiring, the profile, the interview process, your sourcing? like? At, you, you talked about a couple of things, right? The nature of the culture, collaborative versus yep. competitive, the the diversity of the candidates, right? People who came from all walks of life and different backgrounds. Yeah, tell me about how that influenced the, the hiring process. I mean, it influenced everything. It was the center of culture and people were the center of everything. Uh, center of our revenue growth strategy, of our company strategy. And I think the alignment um, across the exec team and uh, the revenue team eventually as we started to scale was critical in achieving that is like at the mm -hmm. end at the center of it it's about investing in our people and building an inclusive culture that's going to win in market because I love winning but I also love building collaborative teams that do it together and so both of those things were super critical and I you know the, the team you build is the company you build mm -hmm. and it's everything and so early days there's you know there's sort of a different lens to it later days you're starting to scale the things that you know work really well but um yeah it was it was at the center of everything we did were there any tactical things that you did differently as you built the team at lattice versus perhaps hiring elsewhere 
that helped you realize that aspiration to build a different kind of sales org? Like questions that you asked or exercises you put folks through, like if we were back, back riding along in the interview process, what would we have experienced very tactically that you did differently? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, I think from the first hire I made, we, we, we categorized the competencies and we built competencies way early. When we were like nine people, we had competencies, which was, you know, super early. Typically, people don't think about having competencies till you're like 30, 40 people in an org. And so we did it early because we wanted to be objective and thoughtful about our hiring versus mm -hmm. it's very easy in startups. There's so many things going on. You go with gut instinct and you can fall trap to 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 hire um, to not hire for what you need and hire for what you think you want. And so um I, we built competencies early on and we categorize them between functional expertise categories and then we've got the values competencies. And so really being thoughtful and, you know, first hire, the functional piece mattered less early on, which actually is a trap. A lot of folks, I think, overvalue the domain expertise, but we were the first, I mean, the first 15, I want to say 15 to 17 folks we hired in sales had no HR tech background. So that tells mm -hmm. you that we cared about the values alignment, people that are curious, mm -hmm. people that are okay with uh, uncertainty and change, uh, folks that can um, figure it out on the ground because we don't have all the answers. And so yeah. for hiring generalists early on was critical. So yeah, tactically what that would look like is we had interviews, dedicated interviews to, uh, to evaluate for values fit. And then we had competencies super early on that became the foundation for even how we did how we did uh, growth and career pathing. You hear this a ton from, from leaders in general, but certainly from sales leaders, uh, these um, soft, uh, I hesitate to use the word soft, but um, not skill-based competencies, creative, right? Or like comfort with ambiguity, um, curious. How did you calibrate your hiring team to know that somebody had it versus didn't. It's one thing to say, ask these questions in an interview, and that's supposed to help you understand whether somebody demonstrates it, but how did you know when somebody was above the bar or below the bar, and how did you scale that as the team grew? Yeah, no, that was, uh, I think early on, it was just, we had a few folks that had, that had you know, were, were in, me including, like I was on every interview panel, um, and so we had a few folks that played that role that were really skilled at identifying like, how does this mm. person react when they're stressed out? What happens when they're not hitting quota? Um, are they still going to uphold the values or are they going to start focusing on uh, local maxima and figuring out how they can optimize for their own number? And so I think putting them in behavioral exercises of what happens if this happens. Um, mm. I am also a huge fan of reference checks. A lot of folks use that as throwaway. But, um, you know, it was a running joke at Lattice that I would do like eight to 10 reference checks early on. And even later on for my leadership hires, I would do a lot of reference checks because over time, even though, you know, reference checks are folks people have picked uh, that mm -hmm. are going to vouch for them, you can start to pick up on trends on like, okay, there's something here that's a blind spot. Um, and it's, it's more about what's a fit for your team and less about, you know, whether this is good or bad. Um, mm. And so identifying that early on and getting more face time, like we do lunches with candidates, like they'd come in, um, you know, spend, spend a couple hours in interview settings. And then we'd say, okay, let's go grab lunch. Uh, because now you get to know them beyond just the, the work and get to know them as a person, which is, which is the most important part. We're spending, you know, eight hours of our lives every day at work. Like some of my teams know me better than, than my own spouse. And so I think just those are some of the tactical things we did, which threw people off. They're like, oh, this is not very, you know, it's very casual. We always heard that. Right. And that was by design. Fascinating. You described how that interview process changes over time. And so you need to get folks who may have been involved in the process testing for certain things to now test for different things. Like, how did you drive that change? Like, what were, what were the moments when you started to drive that change? And how did you actually re-architect your interview process when the business needed different things out of, out of the profiles that you're hiring for? We probably re-architected our hiring. We were all constantly doing it. I mean, we went from you know, 10 people in the sales org, in the revenue org to uh, when I left over 200. And so we had, we had a ton of change uh, where, and there are new roles. So per role had its own competencies. 
Mm. And if you focus in on a specific role, now you're segmenting the org, you're learning new things about the persona you're selling to, the market you're playing in, how competitive it is. Are you creating the market? Are you are you are you typically rip and replacing? So all of those elements, as we got more data points about the business, we mm. had to take it back to the hiring profile. Because another sort of classic trap is you set it and forget it, saying, okay, I've got my competencies. Here's what I'm going to hire for in an AE role. And you never go back to the drawing board, even though now you know that the role is so much different because now you've got seven different teams. You've got an SMB team. You've got a mid-market team, an enterprise team. You've got account management. And each of those roles are different and there's nuance in it. And so we had a great you know, HRBP teams and uh, great recruiting functions that partnered with the sales leadership team in helping us go back and say, as we scaled or as we specialized within the org, we need to go mm. back and say, how do the competencies change? How does the interview process change now because of that? Talk to me more about that partnership. One thing we hear from talent acquisition leaders all the time is our aspiration is to be a strategic partner to the business. And you described a really successful partnership. What did that look like on the receiving end? What were your HRBPs and your, your recruiting leaders bringing to the table that you found really valuable as you re-architected those roles or, or entered new markets or new segments and, and thought about changing the hiring profile? Yeah, I mean, I think it's, I remember uh, early days, like it was probably a few quarters in and, you know, the, early on it was a small team. We had one recruiter who was helping us build out the team across the company before we scaled it up. And we realized that we were just reacting and sort of we would get it, we'd change it. We weren't being, we weren't being, um, we didn't have a process around changing it. It was sort of reactive. If somebody noticed something, they would say, we need to change it. We would have make that happen. And then we moved to a quarterly business review with uh, the recruiting team, which would also include our HRBP and the sales leaders. And there's joint accountability because hiring, I think sometimes tends to be this thing where it's like, well, that's not my job. It's recruiting's job. And mm. I'm a huge believer that, you know, as a leader, like, it's one of the top things you do is recruit great talent to your teams. That's everything. And you have to be a great partner to your talent acquisition leads to make that happen. It can't happen. You know, just recruiting alone can't make it happen. Just sales leaders alone can't make it happen. Mm -hmm. So we really had a strong partnership between the two and QBRs were, you know, it was an hour and a half um, of a discussion and it was an expensive meeting as we scaled, but very, mm -hmm. very important for us to like, really put sort of the fires away and talk about what's working. Let's look at the data. And data really helped helped um, some of these partners be strategic partners to, to the sales team. And so was this a QBR about the business that you were bringing HRVPs and recruiters into? Or was this a QBR about kind of the talent org and hiring? Like what was on the agenda of this conversation? It was purely about talent. And so mm, we talk about great. what are, yeah, so we talked about, we, it'd be retro looking at, how do we do last quarter against our hiring plan? And what was the what were the metrics, time to hire? Um, how do we do on diversity elements? And then looking forward, how do we want to, um, what do we want to change? What was hard, qualitative, quantitative? So we'd look at all of it. We'd have a deck that we'd all review before the meeting. And then mm -hmm. the goal of the meeting was to identify three things we're going to take on as projects. Um, to, to change. And this is where, you know, we'd identify changing up the sales process because now the sales leaders telling the talent team, Hey, the market's changed. We, we need to hire mm -hmm. folks with deal size experience or motion experience because layering mm -hmm. on those elements is almost as important over time because otherwise you can, you can sort of not have the strongest team is, is diverse, not just in its sort of, you know, gender and, race and age, but also in their experience types that they bring to the team. So yeah, those were yeah. very strategic for us. I'm sure those QBRs uncovered mistakes that you made along the way. Um, what like lessons learned when you're building a sales team, things that tend to go wrong, you know, easy uh, you know, you know, pitfalls for, for folks to fall into uh, that if they're really conscious about it, they can avoid. Yeah, I mean, I think one of the classic traps is overvaluing domain expertise or shiny mm -hmm. logos on resumes, um, especially if you're a startup where you're like, okay, and it makes sense. You're like, I want to hire someone who's been at this large company and been really successful there because they've been trained, they know our market, 
I just want to hire them and they're going to do great here. That assumption is, you know, I think it can lead to a lot of challenges if the person, because the resources are different, the, the, the brand value at that big company is so different. And so overvaluing mm-hmm. domain expertise and shiny logos and undervaluing the competencies that you need and your company values that you need to hire for. So that, that is like one of the classic traps. Like I've made that mistake in the past. I see mm-hmm. so many founders, you know, overvalue that I need someone from Salesforce and, you know, it's the, yeah. it's the startup of Salesforce, you know, no offense to Salesforce, a great company. And sometimes it works, but a lot of times you want, you want to make sure that you're really being thoughtful about your market, your company, your persona. Um, and then the second trap is not layering on the right diversity elements to build the strongest team, because mm-hmm. it's easy again to like have the set it and forget it. We've got this. You just keep hiring a ton of folks, but you want to layer in uh, new elements as you continue to scale the first 15 and the next 15, the cohort based hiring and sequencing the right elements is, is key. One of the things that uh, I'm sure you're proud of is like very low uh, voluntary attrition over the course of your tenure at lasting like maybe 2% or something like that. Um, obviously that part of that's getting hiring rights. Uh, and part of that's giving space to grow and develop and, and expand your career and making the right investments in retention over time to talk to us about like uh, the things that you feel like you did really well in order to, to get to that outcome. Yeah. I mean, that is, that is something that I'm most proud of is, is the, is the low voluntary attrition that we had over the four and a half years I was there. Um, and I think a lot of times people overvalue, like for, put a lot of resources. Once you start to do well, you start to like hire for, you put a lot of resources and budgets around hiring mm. and you undervalue retention, which is such a key lever. Like I think, um, HubSpot does this study where the annual turnover for sales orgs is 27%. And it's like the average tenure is 18 months. It costs you 150% uh, to replace a sales rep's salary or 150% of a sales rep's salary is the cost to replace them. So it's expensive mm-hmm. to not invest in retention. Um, and so, yeah, we, we were very intentional about how do we, as we start to scale, how do we create processes and structure, infrastructure, where we can um, align the individual growth to the company's growth. And career pathing mm-hmm. is a great core element of that. You know, I believe that everybody wants to do meaningful work and even sales, quarter carrying sales reps and meaningful work is made up of growth, community and purpose. And mm-hmm. growth is such a key pillar for that. Um, mm-hmm. And so, yeah, I'm, I'm, you know, how do we, we did a lot of things and, and career pathing was one element, um, you know, creating a true community feeling where we all win together uh, mm-hmm. and help each other out was another core element for uh, why folks chose to stay for year four, year five, uh, and felt that, you know, they were getting the growth, they were getting the community, and they felt aligned to the mission of the company. Um, and so, yeah, I think that is, it's a lot of different pieces that, that have to come together. Uh, and yeah, I've made the mistake of overvaluing um, just hiring and not investing just as much in retention of the team. Because if you hire great people, you should do everything in your power to to keep them and find new roles for them. So internal mobility is a key lever that people undervalue. Did you approach interviewing in an internal mobility context differently than you did with external candidates? Like what did it, what, what was the same and what was different as you interviewed or considered internal candidates for like the next role, the next level, the next promotion, uh, given that we're you know, growing careers was such a, an integral part of your strategy. Yeah. I mean, it, we, in a lot of ways, similar where we kept the same competencies and the same process for, for interviewing, except unless it was like a role change, so you're going from a BDR to AE, we, we spent a lot of our enablement uh, practice to build courses to help mm. folks go from, from BDR to AE. So that was part of the career pathing. Same from AE to management. It's, it's a different track. So we don't view that as a promotion. It's like you're going to go from mm. AE to manager. And so we had a team lead program where you got exposure into mm. the role of a manager because it's so different. Being a top rep is very different than being a manager. And we had folks that would like get exposure and say, no, I'm good. I'm going to stay on the AE path because that's where my heart is. And others that yeah. would say, I love it. I love everything that comes with it. Give me a, 
give me a shot at that. So we'd create the exposure as part of the org. And then the process would be similar to how we would hire for external candidates. But get leading up to the the hiring, we would we would do a lot of lot of work across management and enablement to make sure that we know people's aspirations, how does that align to the company's growth. And you know, one thing I didn't say is all oh, none of this is possible unless your company is growing. And so as a leader, the number one focus you should have before you get to any of this is make sure <laughs> that you're that you're putting your company's growth first. Because when that happens, you know, all the champagne problems show up and then you get to solve them. That's the ultimate right. goal. Totally. I love the idea of the making it very explicit that there's like an individual contributor path and there's a managerial path and it's not like one leads to the next just up, right? They're parallel and you can make a choice mm -hmm. in either direction to create space for people who have different aspirations and skills and, and passion. Totally. Um, Dini, thank you so much for joining me today, dropping a lot of knowledge about growing from 20 to 200, an amazing run. I'm going to put you on the spot. Now you're, now you're taking a break and a breather, well-deserved. What do you think about next? Like when, you know, what, what are you going to interview for next? I have no idea. Uh, and that's exciting, which is, you know, right now I'm doing nothing and everything at the same time and uh, just... This is my first break in 19 years, and I'm I'm on the learning curve on how to take a break. And so right now I'm just focused on such a tight the answer. I'm learning how to do a good break before I figure out what's next. But yeah, I'm excited uh, to eventually tackle what next mountain I want to climb. Fantastic. Well, thank you for making this part of your learning curve on taking a break. Hopefully, this is like you know just breathing in a walk in the park. Uh, but thank you for joining us today. Dini Mehta, uh, former CEO of Lattice, dropping a ton of knowledge on building a team, hiring, internal mobility, promotions. And uh, I love the three pillar framework around meaningful work, uh, growth, community, passion, purpose, purpose and purpose. Uh, I love that. Um, Dini, thanks again for joining us. Thank you. Bye. Bye.